Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to Billis Parish Church this morning. It's been lovely the last couple of weeks to start our service outside the church, but I'm recording this on a Thursday afternoon, the Thursday before the Sunday, and all I'll say is that the weather is more suitable for ducks, and I didn't bring my wetsuit or my flippers or, or my armbands with me, so we're starting our service this week inside the church. Well, last week I had a number three with me, this week I have a number two, and it means that this is the second last Sunday before we are under the government guidelines able to open our church doors again and to worship, albeit in a slightly different way, and I'll say more about that over the next couple of weeks before we open, but we're able to come and to gather as God's people again. So two more online services, although they will continue in different ways beyond today. Wherever you're joining from, you're very welcome. Lovely to have you join here with us, whether it's across the Virginia group and the four churches, Billis, Killing, Kier, Lurgan or Munter Connett, or whether it is further afield in the community or even beyond, it's great to have you here with us. As always, everything that you need for the service, the words that I invite you to join in will appear on the screen, the words of the hymns and so on will all be there. So as we come, we gather as God's people together. Troubled prophets and struggling families, you listen to our voices, whoever you are. There is no one like you, God of the listening heart. Those who live in fear and those who look for signs, you fill us with hope and surprises. There is no one like you, God, of steadfast love. Seekers of power as well as those who serve the vulnerable. You challenge us to use our gifts for others. There is no one like you, God of all people. Well, today is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the, the dads out there. And we're going to join together in a hymn that reflects something of God as Father. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. In the Church of Ireland hymnal, it's number 224. Do join as we sing these words together. Oh 
how deep the Father's love for us. It's wonderful to sing a hymn that reminds us of God's deep and unconditional love for us. And it's just as well because we continue to mess up, we continue to fail God, we continue to fall short of God's standards. But when our faith is in Jesus, we know that we can continue to come to God and to enjoy his deep and unconditional love. And as we confess our sins constantly before him, we know that that unconditional love showers us with his grace and with his mercy. So let's come and confess our sins. We struggle daily with that human tendency to always do wrong. We say hurtful things. We turn our backs on others. But God will never hold our sins against us or our foolish nature. So let us confess to our God who frees us forever from judgment as we say the words of the confession together. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and we repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins, restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come to prepare to hear God's word. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth will proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. This week's reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 6, reading verses 35 to 40. And during my sermon I will refer to the key verse, which is verse 37. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Euro Sermon. Well, today on this Father's Day, I have brought something with me that I'm not sure I really am worthy to wear. It'll come up on the screen here beside me in a moment. But as we think of our dads, what comes to mind? What are the things today that we are thankful for about our dads? Well, as I think of my dad, I think just how important family was to him. I always sensed growing up that family was really important and we got to spend lots of great time, as did my brother and sister with him, played lots of golf together, we went off to different rugby matches together, but it was always knowing just how much he loved his family was something that always sticks with me. And I hope he knows how much his family love him. And one of the great privileges that I still sometimes 
shake my head and wonder is the privilege of being a dad. I know lots of people don't have that privilege, but for me, being a dad has just been wonderful. And so today, I have brought with me something that I could pin on my scarf here. I've got lots of different things on my scarf. You might wonder what they are. On the bottom of the scarf is a, a diocesan logo. It, it's a symbol of office uh, of being archdeacon in the diocese. On this bit of bling here is the symbol of St. Patrick's Cathedral, where I have the privilege of being the diocesan canon there. But I think that I could pin this on my scarf as well, although I don't think it is true. But it's a rosette which comes up on the screen here beside me and it says Super Dad on it. Super Dad on it. Now I would like to think that I'm not a bad dad, that I'm a pretty good dad, that I try my best dad. I'd love to think that I'm a great dad, but I'm not sure that I would be confident enough to say that I am a, a super dad because I know that sometimes I can get a bit grumpy. I know that sometimes I, I'm not the best dad. I know sometimes I, I go and I try my very best, but I'm not sure that I'm a super dad because I know that I let my children down sometimes. But it's great to know that they love me despite that. So on this Sunday when we're thankful for dads, I wonder is there a dad that really is a super dad? Well for me, as we think about what it might teach us about the Christian faith, is that there is a dad who we can call dad who is super. And it's a surprising name that we can call God. But God is our Heavenly Father. In fact, Jesus tells us that we can call him Abba, Father, which is like the name Daddy that we might call our own dads. And unlike us dads who get it wrong, who are not perfect, God is a perfect dad, a dad who is dependable, a dad who is loving, a dad who really is deserving of the title Super Dad, a dad who is forgiving, a dad who is unconditionally loving. So while I'm not sure I could wear the rosette that says Super Dad, I know that if I could pin it onto God's lapel, it would be a very fitting rosette for him to wear because he really is a super dad and a wonderful dad that we can call Father today and every day. We're going to join together in our next action song and it's a great song that reminds us that God is good, that God is great. Our super dad on this Father's Day. God is good, God is great, He's the one who did create everything that there is by His power. God is good, God is great, He's the one who did create everything that there is by His power. Thank you, Lord, for the things I can see. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the sounds I can hear. Thank you, Lord. God is good, God is great. He's the one who did create everything that there is by his power. God is good, God is great. He's the one who did create everything that there is by his power. Thank you, Lord, for my family. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for One who did create everything that there is by his power. 
God is good, God is great, He's the one who did create everything that there is by His power. Thank you, Lord, for the birds in the sky. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the ants on the ground. Thank you, thank you, Lord. God is good, God is great, He's the one who did create everything that there is by His power. God is good, God is great, He's the one who did create everything that there is by His power. Thank you, Lord, for your love to me. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're always near. Thank you, thank you, Lord. God is good, God is great. He's the one who did create everything that there is by His power. God is good, God is great. He's the one who did create everything that there is by His power. And so I speak in the name of the one true and living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, last week we looked at the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, a tragic hymn, a tragic story, but a wonderful truth that whatever we experience in life, God is with us. We can rest in his presence. We can be reassured by his truths and we can be re-energized and renewed. Well, today we come to the 11th of our hymns during this closed season. We're getting ever closer to the doors of our churches being open. Even though our church is more than a building, it will be lovely to gather in God's house, to worship together and to sing together as we join in our services in a few weeks' time. Well, the hymn that I've chosen for today is the hymn, Just As I Am, written by Charlotte Elliott. So who was she? What was her story? And most importantly, what does our hymn tell us about what is at the heart of the Christian faith and what is at the heart of God and who he is? Well, Charlotte Elliot was born in Clapham in London in 1789. As a young woman, like with many of that age, she led a carefree life, gaining popularity as a portrait artist and as a writer of humorous verse. But by the time she was in her 30s, her health begins to fail rapidly, and as a result of illness, she was largely immobile. However, as the story goes, she did continue to give recitals, to recite poems, English prose, and so on. And at the conclusion of one of these evenings, as the guests who were there gathered together, as they raved and fawned over her, a pastor called the Reverend Dr. Caesar Melon from Switzerland introduced himself to her. And as they talked, he asked her a very straightforward question. He asked her, was she a Christian? That he hoped that she was a Christian. Now apparently, as the story goes, Charlotte Elliot bristled, as many do today when they are asked that direct question. Are you a Christian? She said she would rather not discuss the question. And so Malan apologised if he had given any offence. Well, a few weeks later, she saw the pastor again and she apologised to him. She said, I'm sorry for my rudeness. Actually, I would like to come to Christ, but I do not know how I can do that. Well, the pastor looked at her and said, come just as you are. And she accepted Jesus as her Saviour and Lord that day. And you know, it really is that simple. Acknowledging who we are before God and accepting Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. Well, despite her limiting ailments as best she could, 
through, she threw herself until the end of her life into her Christian faith. For example, she edited at the time a well-known magazine called The Religious Remembrance. But in 1835, about 12 years after her conversion, her brother was raising funds for a school for the daughters of clergymen, St. Mary's Hall. And she was frustrated because she was not able to help with the project given her limitations. And as many perhaps feel when they can't do as much as they would like, she felt useless and worthless, perhaps even that God had rejected her. And as a result, she fell into deep doubt. But as she pondered her situation, the words of that pastor all those years before came back to her. Just come as you are before God. And it inspired her to write a poem which became a hymn for others who equally were in that situation where they doubted their worth and their value before God. And the words that she wrote became one of the greatest soul winning songs and hymns in the history of hymn writing. And as we pick up on them, there is something very raw about them, something very vulnerable about them now and then, and especially as we know the story behind them. They take on, as we've seen with our other hymns, a new meaning and a depth and a connection with us. Well, what we notice at the beginning of each of the first four verses of the hymn is a truthful statement about why Charlotte, about why we may feel, many may feel, that they can't come to God. What excuses they give, what hang-ups they and we might have, or why God may not want us even to come before him. Just as I am, she writes, without one plea, just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting and fears within. Just as I am, poor and wretched and blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind. Almost a sadness of not being worthy to come before the living God. But as we get to the last three verses of the hymn, verses 5, 6 and 7, there is this beautiful moment almost. There is a beautiful change in emphasis and tone which provides us with a great news or a gospel news, a good news, a great reminder. You see, despite all the things that Charlotte writes in those opening verses, which are true, which are reasons that should separate us from God, our sin, our doubt, our fear, our lack of trust, our humanness between us and God. Despite all of those things, the wonderful news that she encapsulates in this hymn is that God still desires us to come to him just as I am. Vulnerable, honest, real and raw before God. Despite all of those things, God still says, come to me. And so this emphasis begins to change. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse and relieve. Just as I am, thy love unknown hath broken down every barrier. Just as I am, of that free love, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height to prove. And then there is this crowning moment of each verse. O Lamb of God, I come. The Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world upon the cross, enables us to say, O Lamb of God, I come. Despite my failings and shortcomings, despite my unworthiness or my sense of not being able, 
It is through you, Jesus, through the cross, through the empty tomb, that I can come and simply say, just as I am. The hymn is actually a reminder of the truthful words of Jesus that we read a little earlier in the service from John chapter 6, verses 35 to 40, specifically verse 37. In this passage, Jesus is inviting all around him are, who are listening to come to God by faith. And it gives us the same beautiful sense as with the hymn of God's response when we come just as we are before him. The end of verse 37 simply says this, words from the mouth of God. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Did you hear those words? Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Listen to those words. Allow them to penetrate past your fears and your worries, your excuses and your pride about coming before God through Jesus. And if you have, allow them to remind you what a precious thing we have when we do respond to God and come before him. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away, says God. Well, within a matter of years, Charlotte Elliot had the hymn published and from there it spread and gained in popularity. Now, remember I said that she was feeling worthless because she could not do much to help her brother's project to raise funds for the school? Well, in her own lifetime, Charlotte learned that copies of the poem were being sold and the money was being donated from St. Mary's Hall, or for St. Mary's Hall, rather. The very project she thought she could not help. Rather, God took her and used his way, his inspiration, and that she could help in her own gifts and ways. Well, in spite of her illness, Charlotte lived to be 82. She died on September the 22nd, 1871. And after her death, clearing her estate, her things, more than a thousand letters were found among her papers, written by people telling her how her hymn and its message had touched and changed their lives. It is a wonderful hymn. So today, as the hymn continues to be sung, as it is sung in many different languages, as it's sung by people of every age and every station of life, as it has brought people humbly to kneel before God and to make it their prayer of penitence, we are thankful once again for Charlotte, for her real story of faith, her grounded story of faith, how her life inspires her to write this hymn, and how it is used to communicate the great truths of God and that great invitation of God to come, to come through Jesus and to enjoy a real and personal and deep relationship with him, covered in God's unconditional love for each of us. Come, I will never drive you away. So today we can come no other way but as we are before God. And my prayer is that in our hearts and minds as we sing this hymn now, this wonderful hymn, that we would simply respond in the most real and vulnerable way, just as I am, O Lamb of God. I come. And I share these words through the one who makes it all possible, the one whom we call Jesus. Amen.
And so we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide and defend our rulers, and grant our government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness, and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And let your glory be over all the earth. O oh God, make clean our hearts within us and renew us by your Holy Spirit. And the collect for today, the second Sunday after Trinity. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Our prayers of intercession, a wonderfully intimate moment when we come just as we are before God, as a parish in a group of parishes, as a community, as a world, as a nation, as people, we come before the living God. And as I pray, I stand in the heart of the church. And it reminds us that the heart of the church is twofold. It's about Jesus and our relationship with him. But it's also about being God's community together. Journeying, praying, worshipping, hoping, encouraging supporting. So as we gather together and pray, we pray for the church, we pray for our world, we pray for each other. We are reminded that we are all invited to God's wedding banquet and in accepting we must allow the rags of our old life to be exchanged for the freely given robes of holiness and right living, of grace and forgiveness. So invited by our God, our living God, we gather here and we voice our prayers. Father, we pray for your church across the Virginia group of parishes, each church across our community, wherever and however God's people gather today. We pray for your church around the world. We pray for your church across our nation across every Christian denomination. We pray for your church as it puts into practice the plans to reopen in a couple of weeks' time. We pray that in our apprehension to do that, in all the work to do that, that we may provide places where people will come, will feel safe, will feel cared for, and more than all of that, will meet and experience just as they are, the risen Christ. Father, we're either the traditional or the progressive blinds us to your truth. Clear our vision. Speak through our prejudices until we are once again open to your changing. May we be, before everything else, your people, sharing your concerns your desires across this group of parishes, across our diocese of Kilmore, Elford and Arda, remembering Bishop Ferrin in our prayers, wherever God's people meet, 
may you simply be our purpose and our vision. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our world that is broken and unequal, a world where not everyone is valued. We recognize how powerful the influences are in our world, which distract many and lead many away from your truth. We pray for our world and in our land, in our communities, through our government as it prepares to form for the first time, through all local leadership. We pray for the quiet whisper of your wisdom to be noticed and acknowledged in many lives. We pray for widespread discipline of the heart and a new openness to the generosity of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for ourselves. We pray for our homes. We pray for the homes of our loved ones. We pray for our daily schedules, however they look for us today, that you may be part of our lives and we may dwell in the territory of your kingdom where it is your will which guides and your love which rules. And Lord, we want to pray for ourselves. We pray for those who we normally would see on a Sunday in church. We pray for those who we normally would interact with over a week. We pray for those who we know are struggling. We pray for those in our nursing homes. And Heavenly Father, how wonderful it was to go and to spend time with some of those in one of our nursing homes this week and to see their smile of joy as we enjoyed some simple fellowship in that way. But we pray for those who we cannot yet visit in our nursing homes. We pray for those in our hospitals, those who are housebound, those who are lonely. We pray for those who are coping with illness, both new illness and long-term illness. We pray for those who are going through treatments. We pray for those who care for them, who worry about them, who are stressed about them. We pray for those who continue to work through the pain of bereavement. We pray for those whose lives are drawing to a close. We pray for those who we know are struggling today. So whatever is on our hearts and minds, whoever we think about in this very moment, we take a few moments to bring them and our own lives just as we are before the God who says, come, I will never drive you away. So we spend a few precious moments praying to our Heavenly Father. Father, our hearts rail against the cruelty and unfairness of suffering and disease, and we kneel now alongside all in pain in a symbolic way. We weep with them. We cry out to you for them. And in their lives and ours, we pray for comfort and the healing of your love. For you are no bringer of evil to our lives, but you share our sorrow and you give us the grace to bear it. Just as I am, whatever we have brought before our unconditional loving Heavenly Father, whoever we've brought, we simply say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, it is such an honour to be called and invited to your banquet. Make us worthy of our calling through Jesus. And as we pray these prayers, we ask, merciful Father, that you would accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we finish our time of prayer together by joining together in the words of the Lord's Prayer and then the grace.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, like I said at the beginning of the service, I am recording this on a Thursday afternoon. Hopefully it is drier as we're watching this on the Sunday morning. But you can see behind me, it's pretty wet, so I'm only going to go as far as the door. But it does remind us always that we still continue to be sent out beyond any church building, beyond any walls, to be God's people wherever we are today. God sends us out to be witnesses to grace. We will speak of all that God has done. Jesus sends us out into every neighborhood and community. We will go to bear the burdens of everyone that we meet. The Spirit sends us out on a journey of faithfulness. We will go to see everyone through the eyes of compassion. And as we journey this week and far beyond, we pray that we would know and those that we love, those that we pray for, those of this church, this group of parishes, this community, would know God's blessing deeply upon them always as we are in our lives. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us now and always. Amen. And so we go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.